And I remember what I wrote was just what I have learned from these quotes and tutorials that I read from other blogs. <laughs> and the one that uh, Nile sent like last week, I just combined them together. So the network was trying to use this heaters data set. So it's like a basketball, a basketball, no, it's a baseball, right? It's baseball and it's like, they are trying to predict like the salary based on what they have done, what these baseball players has done the previous years, like the number of hits, number of home runs, how many tournaments they attend. And they also have like some correlated values, like number of times I've been during this person's career. <laughs> so that's the main idea is to estimate the salary. So the subset selection method, like they don't have a tidy models for it. So I just use what the book has to provide and make some little changes later I'll show. So they use this function from this package. And then the rest are kind of like the same, like the linear regression, like we find the predict salary and we use all the predictors that we have. And this eight was just to say that we stopped to like eight predictors to choose from. And then it's a default one. And then we take like the summary to see the results. So because the summary is quite large, I just put this it's easier for me. And they say like, oh, like the best two variable model is just the one that indicated by the star, like all oh, these the two, it's like hits and this uh, the number of what's that one? I think it's uh, number of runs, yeah, the number of runs in the person's career. And then it goes to like the eight, then like eight variables will be chosen for the model. And then the book like increased up to 19 because they were like nine. 19 predictors and then they were trying to like calculate these values that we went through last week then they first go through like the all the r square values and true enough like they started to increase like they just keep increasing as you add the number of predictors from like 0 0.32 to, to 0 0.54 okay then you can also try this function, this like package also like provides like a plot function for this object. And they see that for the skills, that like they just choose VIC as one of them, but I think you can just choose the others as well. But this is the plot they give. And they say that when they have the lowest VIC is at like six of the six of the variables. And they see that oh they, from there we can pick like this is the subset that we should use. Then they have this function that's help us to get the coefficient values. Then they go through like for the same leaps, uh, this wrap subsets function can also have a forward and a backward method. You just add this additional command. So it's the same thing, but this time it does a forward stepwise selection instead of the best subset selection. So it's, and then likewise, you can also get the coefficients for the front and back, like, but they will look different. Like this is the full subset for seven. And this is the forward one. And this is the backwards selection. And they give different results. Then the book goes through the choosing the models using like this validation set method. So what I did a bit differently was that I have the split, but they split by training and test. And then the, the training, I split again for some validation and one that's just pure training. So what I did was that for the one that's just training, we put inside the function. 
and then we create this dummy matrix and then we calculate all the errors, the mean square error. And these are the mean square errors that we have. And if for one variable, two variables, all the way to 19 variables, and then we take the smallest one. So they form my seed, which is one, two, three, four, it's uh, the 11 variables. But if you choose a different seed, maybe you will give a different value. And then from this 11, I retrain the I have trained again for the full data, the full training, which contains both the validation and the train. <laughs> and then I get the coefficients. And then I, the book says that it does not have a predict function. So we have to make one for ourselves. And then I use the predict function to on both the training and the real test data. And unfortunately for my seat, uh, the, the test data kind of from worse than the training data. <laughs> and then I, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then we go through the cross validation part. And it's kind of like the same, I did the same thing as what the book did, like it splits the train and test, but no more additional splitting, but we do a, cross flow validation. So this, what it does is that it repeats one n times, repeat two n times, repeat three n times. It's basically trying to create this kind of data set, but for 10 of them. So the same thing is that they create a matrix of errors. Uh, it's a 10 by 19 matrix, whereby the rows are like the number of folds. And the 19 is the variables because we are choose, comparing between whether to choose one up to 19 variables. So this is just calculating all the cross validation errors, but there are 10 of them. And then uh, what they did is that after we got the matrix, they just take the mean for each of the subsets of the variables. Like for the first, uh, for example, like for the a case where we pick only one variable, uh, it takes the mean of all the cross validated data. So this is the mean, like for one variable, two variable, up to 19. And they say that in this case, the minimum is at the 11th one, which is kind of similar to the cross, the validation method as well. So because everything was the same, so the rest is kind of the same as well because it's, you choose the same number of predictors. <laughs> and as expected, the perform worse on the test data. So this is all for the part for the subset selection method. And then I go through like the rich regression and that's where the tidy models existed. So I decided to try it out and I try to link them to which package they belong to for some of the functions and try to provide hyperlinks just in case you have any reference, you can just use the hyperlinks. I think it should lead you to the right website. <laughs> And then, uh, so what tidy models does is that for the same data set, uh, we first want to go through like, like some introduction first like, to understand how to use the tidy model. So like for the rich regression, they use this function and they first make everything like hard coded values like mixture zero, penalty zero, and then they say, to use regression and they want to use the GlimNets uh, function. And then I realized that you can actually have a, Passnet has a translate function. So it actually shows a clearer picture of what function it's using and what is the variables, the parameters it's actually really calling. So later they go through that you can actually use a 
parts need fit to fit the data, kind of like similar to the previous function for the subset selection. So everything looks, looks the same. And then after that, we can, after it fits, you can see how it looks like by, I use the part snip tidy to show like, because I never specified the, because I specified the penalty to be like the learning rate to be zero. So it only gives only zero when all the, and all the estimates. And this is actually like, like the coefficient. So this estimate is the same as these coefficients estimated using this tidy, Hasnip tidy. And then they say that if you want different penalty values, you can oh, just- Sorry, add. the penalty value was when you add in was a zero, is it? Yes, yes, the first one was zero. Oh, okay. So you add yeah, in yeah. the penalty zero. Okay, then the next one Yeah, is so now it's this, the one is zero. Uh, they just play with different values. <laughs> Seven or five. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but, but later we'll tune it. Lah, so it's, it, we'll choose the best one later. But this is just introduction. I was, like, I was playing around with this. <laughs> and then they also have this extract feed engine. Like what it does is that currently, like our rich feed is a parsnet object and we can't actually use functions that are related to the glimnets package to plot stuff and give other things. So what so to do that to transform from parsnet object to a real glimnet object back to where it originally is. So they use this function so that the plot actually works. So this plot does not come from the tidy model. It actually comes from glimnet. And this function shows that a glimnet object is returned and we can actually use the plot function in the end. Sure, it's like, yeah, it's the plot function. So you see the plot from glimnet, this is exactly the same as recalling it from the package, it's from the glimnet package itself. So this is the part where we actually have to tune the different parameters for the lambda or the penalty in our case. And then they say that they need to split them to three different tasks. So first was to create a resample because currently we're just using the whole hipsters uh, data set, but we need like, to split it first. And then I need to create a workflow containing the model and do some pre-processing. And then I need to have a penalty grid, which, really, which contains the different values of all the penalties because currently I just hard code them. <laughs> So I just go through like slowly what was done and then they said they use this initial split training and testing from the R samples package. So okay, I tried them out and this is what I have. This this strata they say is just to do like smart splitting like stratification, but, but salary is kind of like a continuous data. So I don't know why they do it, but okay, then let's just do what they tried, what was asked in the blog. And then I did this is when I first met the recipe again. And then I realized that we had to do like pre-processing steps. And it turns out like they say like the order of the pre-processing is quite important. So they have this page that I put here to give some advice on how they reorder the pre-processing steps, which, which they will go through, I will go through it later. And then they say that after you do your pre-processing steps, you can actually use like prep and bake to see how the values will transform. So I just try to do them like step by step. So the first part is, so when I use the prep function and take a close look at it, it just tells me which are the predictors and which are the outcomes of the salary. And it also tells me like, oh, which one is categorical and which one is, and which one is like numeric. 
Okay, I guess this chat explains what the Stratai Gracelli really does. So thank you, thank you. Okay, the next part is that they pick the function. So because I didn't do any pre-processing sets, so everything kind of looks the same. <laughs> So this is the part where they did all the, the pre-professing steps from the blog. And I tried to do like one by one to see what they were actually trying to do. So they first did this for me. So what it does is that it creates, it creates new variables this new, and then it turns them into the dummy matrix. So at first I did not understand like why they must have this step normal, but I have, so I did some research and provided this link here. So basically what it tells you is that usually the problem we have with test data and when we have categorical, uh, predictors is that the test data may contain a certain group or category that the training data does not have. Like for example, when we split the data, we may be very unlucky that our training data don't have a specific category. And then the test data has a category that, that is like out of the blue and it's brand new. So if this was to put me back into the training data, it may cause some errors. So to prevent that, uh, a new uh, column was created called this new, so that if we have a case whereby we have a brand new category, like for example, this leak N, it was actually N and W, but if a, a new alphabet case up, comes out, right, then this value will become one. So currently, if we take a look at all this, this new column is actually all zero currently. So after this turning all these categorical to like these dummy variables, they they do like a normalization and remove those with like no variation like this one. So again, when we do like the prep and bake again, then we can see all the, the transformed data except for the salary. So after the pre-professing set, this is like similar to the previous part where we specify the model, but this time we need to tune the penalty while we still keep the mixture to be zero. So the tune is to ensure that we have like different values of the penalty that comes in to do a list cross, to do a validation on the cross validation data set, which was earlier here. So this time when we do like the translate, uh, it, it kind of looks the same, but this time is you have this tune function. So now that we have like the tune function, we put it into the workflow. So we say this is how we create an empty workflow. Uh, we already have the formula for the recipe. So we, and this is how it records it down. So, now we need to create like the different values of the lambdas. So they have this like function called grid regular that help us to like separate the lambdas into nice equal parts. So what it's trying to do is like we split them from 10 to minus 5 to 10 to the power of 5. So these are like our different penalty values all the way from 10 to the power of minus 5 to 10,000 and it's split into 50 parts. So this is like our penalty grid and then we apply it to our cross-validated data. So what I did here is that because when I do this in my work computer, it was a bit slow and I need to do this like use more of its computer cost so that the process will be faster. So after tuning with the cross validated data with the Pacific grid and workflow, it kind of gives like a table with full of 
data and lists. Like this is all like the metric and this is like each fold that it uses. The notes just tells you if there's any problems with your, when it's trying to do the fitting, but this is empty, it means it's no problems. And usually at the problem, they give you a warning. So from this matrix, we can do a plot and the default part, tune has its own auto plot that you can use. But if you want to customize it, we can use ggplot, which I'll show later. Like this is the root mean square error. If the root mean square error is the, if we go back to the forward direct selection, uh, we see the, this mean here. So the root mean square error is the square root of this value. So now, create our grid. Yeah, so they have like two metrics for the for each penalty value. And then we can use, after we collect them, we can also plot the same thing, but I can use like ggplot to plot with some error bars. So from there, we can see that like the best value is probably around here. So what I tried was that you can use the show best to show like top five based on a certain metrics. So I tried that and they give like this value of around five, six, nine. So we can pick them using the select best. And now that we have like the best penalty, the lambda value for the cross validated data, we retrain the whole model again with the full training set. So we set this tune finalized workflow, which now no longer in tune, but now it's the actual optimized value. And then we have our, we can do like, we can refit it with the trading model. And then we can, see the estimates for our optimized penalty values, our coefficients. And then we can also use the VIP function as well to see how important it is. Actually, uh, when I see this positive, uh, this importance right, is actually the same value as the estimate. <laughs> Just one positive and some negative. <laughs> so we can also like plot them in like this form to see which variables are important. And then I try on the test data. And when I do like parsnip augment, it creates this dot prick to get, this was trying to predict this value, but this one maybe is not overshot. This one really, really overshot. It's a bit hard to, uh, to see how well it performs. So you can use the yardstick to see how well it's doing. And they say that there's also another way we can use is to use this last fit function, but this time the input is different. Like for the augment, we use the test data, but when we use the last fit function, we actually use this split, the one that that we split, which is this one. So from the split, we can also do the same thing. We can also collect the matrix and we can also collect the prediction that was made. It should be the same value as here. So I can, because we have this, this one and this one, we can also plot graphs to see how well it fits from the predicted versus the actual value. And this is how it looks like. So because it's the, the now we go to lasso and because it's kind of like similar to the bridge regression, like everything kind of repeats itself like 
the workflow starts to repeat. So it's just few changes. So everything is the same except the mixture is just turned to one instead of zero. And then uh, why it's mixture is one and zero, where, where it comes from? Well, I actually have to look at another website, which I will send in the chat. So if we take a look at, let's see if it's, yeah, there's this Glimnet is actually doing, there's actually another regression that we never go through called the elastic net. And it kind of looks the same as our rich regression and our lasso whereby this is our RSS. And this part is our lasso. And this part is our rich regression. And this is our lambda that we're trying to tune earlier. And you can see that this is actually our mixture value. So when our mixture initially, when we do like rich regression, this was zero. So this thing was gone and was left with this. So we had our rich regression. So now for lasso, we use the alpha, the mixture equals to one. So we only have this part instead. So technically, the GlimNet is able to tune both this one and this one. It's just that we never, in our example, in our lab work, uh, because we never go through this regression, we just give them a fixed value. But technically, it's possible to tune both of them at the same time. So back to the last reg regression, we have, we just, all I do was just change the mixture to one and everything was kind of the same whereby the pre-processing is the same, the specify of the model is the same, the creation of the workflow is the same, I just use mixture equals to one. The grid, however, they recommend a different grid. So I, it's the same thing, but minus two to two, which creates 50 parts of zero, from 0 0.01 all the way to 100. And then for this new grid, we do it on the cost validated data by doing the tuning. And then we have these uh, metric values, which we can plot them to see which one, which uh, penalty value, which lambda is the best. So it's around here. And of course, uh, we can also collect the metrics and do our ggplot by ourselves as well, which looks something like this. And then we use the same thing, this tune best, show best, and we had a penalty of around 20.2 for our cross-validated data. And then we do the same thing where we can uh, see the penalty, what is the coefficients for the optimized penalty value. And you can see that some of the values actually turn to zero, which is kind of uh, expected from what we learned from our last regression is that it's supposed to make some of the variables zero so that we can know which one is, which predictors are really important. And then we plot the same variable importance plot. Uh, we can see like most can become the zero. And then the same thing is that we can apply it to the, to the test data to make predictions. And for me, it kind of look the same and repetitive but in terms of performance uh, maybe not as good as the previous switch regression but that is kind of expected because it uses like less predictors and most of them became zero so I after last so I tried this reasonable components regression so the front part is the same again we resample the objects and this time the difference comes in the pre-processing step whereby they have this like recipe step PCA. And what it does is that they perform the PCA values. Now you can see that once you apply the steps, you can see this 
all derive, all our predictors become PC1 to PC4. And checking the documentation of these steps, uh, what I realized was that uh, the step PCA uses this function to do the PCA when to perform the PCA. And then we can also see how the transform value that looks like this using the prep and bake method. And from there, we can uh, also uh, explore some of the principal components that we have. Like we can use the prep and then we can explore what are the code what are the values you got transformed into? We can perform that plot to see how the first four PCA looks like. Because in the end, the PC1, PC2, they are all just expressed in terms of all their predictors. Because that's the purpose of this uh, transformation is that it's to transform into something that is in terms of all its predictors. So some may be more, some may be less. And then we can look at the top six variables. So what I did was that I follow one block on Julia Silky and we can do the same thing for this data set to see like the top six important loadings instead of seeing everything at the same time, which may be quite hard, especially if you have so many um, predictors. So well, after this, uh, we can also find the variance. So what I did was that I used the broom tidy. This is not the part snip tidy. This is the broom type. type. The tidy is from the broom, the package. And then I choose the type to be variance. And then I can see the variance. But, but the problem is it also contains these cumulative variance and other things. So I need to tidy them up to look like this and then what I want was just the percent variance and then I can plot them to see how much percent of variance each PCA was trying to take. As for the tuning, uh, I can tune by the number of components, they also can tune by this threshold value. So the threshold value is it's just the fraction of total variance cover that should be covered by the principal components. So if the case of 0 0.75 is that, let's say if four principal components is able to cover like more than 75%, we just stop at four. So something like that. Then we, they, because both, can, only one of them can be tuned, at, can be tuned, you can't tune both of them. For this case, I choose the threshold. For the partial least square, I would choose this one instead because I was trying to experiment and see which to, to learn more about it. So now that we can, uh, we are tuning the threshold instead of picking a hard value, we can now uh, do our tuning. Uh, this is everything is the same, right? This time I just they just use the usual ln function, no, no, no special glimnet function. So it's just the usual ln. And then they decide to create the workflow. So this kind of looks the same, except with the extra step PCA, and this time they use the ln for the Grid, uh, it's a percentage from zero to one. So we can use this grid uh, threshold. And this creates 10 different parts from zero to one. And then we apply it to our cost validated data set. And then we plot them for each threshold. And we can see that around this point, around like, 60% like the R square is like the highest. Uh, unfortunately, this time for this case, the root mean square error and the R square don't agree upon which one is the best threshold. But uh, nevertheless, I will just pick one of them for learning experience. 
in this is the same thing I just thought in ggplot style. And we can use the show best and the select the best based on a specific metrics. But in this case, they I just follow what the block told me and I just pick this R, the root means square error. And we have this uh, best uh, threshold value. And then we apply the threshold value to, to the workflow. And then we fit the training set. Yeah, we fit the training set to the final model. And, and we once we have fitted it, we can extract it and see and take a closer look. And when we use the extract fit, it becomes uh it becomes an LM object. And for LM object, we can use the broom tidy to take a closer look at each of the coefficients, but they are all transformed, so I'm not sure if it's that useful. But, but because we it's an LM object, we can also use to find all these AIC and BIC values as well using the broom glance. Uh, however, it's already been transformed, so I don't think it's much of a use. But, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> And then likewise, we apply the, the PCA regression model to our test data, giving this prediction. And then I check the final R square, and the rest is all the, the same, and you can just collect the prediction and plot this graph. And it seems, when I see this graph compared to the other two, it, I think this is like, better maybe because uh there are so many variables that are correlated to each other so perhaps what i suspect is maybe like like maybe this one and this one becomes like they've been like transformed and joined together and so the last part is they use this partial list where whereby they also use the predicted values to do the transformation. And uh, this time the change is that they use this step PLS. And the step PLS, when I first tried to install it, it, it didn't work for me because it was using this mix or mix to perform the PLS. And then when I tried to install it, I realized that the this mix or mix is actually a bioconductor package. So the installation may be a bit different. So let me see if I can get the documentation. No, this is a mix or mix bioconductor. Yeah, so if you are not so familiar with bioconductor, uh, to install the mix or mix, you have to first install the biocom man bioconductor manager first. Then after you install this, then you can install the mix or mix package. So now we have the partial least square the we can this one is just for me exploring so i just pick all the components and the outcome is the salary and just do a little exploring so exploring wise i try to do the same thing as what i did for the the pca so we can also do like the prep and the bake to see what the values have been what our data has been transformed into and then i can use the tidy and uh, prep to see the different value of the, I mean, the different steps and values in a more tidy way. And then because it's a more tidy way, we can plot the 
how each of the predictors are being used for each transform variable. So like the PLS, like the PCA is also can be, is written in terms of its predictors. And likewise, uh, we can also do like top five and top, top six in this case uh, for each of the components if there are too many predictors to see. So in this case, the PRS, the only thing that we can tune is this number of components. So we put the tuning function here. And then the, we use the usual, uh, the default linear model that from the stats. And then everything else is kind of the same. The grid we from one to 20. And then uh, we do it on the cross-validated data. We see the metrics again, uh, the two of them kind of contradict each other. So it's but, but for uh, learning sake, uh, we just pick this one instead. But because the number of components may be a bit too small, I'm not sure if it works well, but the book, the, the block just picks this one as the matrix. So it pick this one, I can see the top five and yeah, it, it gives a, a sorry, it picks one. So <laughs> in this case, I, it, does not, it will not work as well, but because it, it, it picks only one. <laughs> And then we just apply it to the test data set after we finalize the workflow. And the rest is all like the same because we use the LM package and we can extract the LM object and do some statistical analysis and results. But most importantly, is what does it does it work? Does it work on the test data? And so and this is how it looks like. I, I did not have time to compare all the four R squares together, but I think this 0 0.46 and it's a bit, a 0 0.46, this one, 0 0.49. So, so zero point four nine. This is zero point four eight. Yeah, so I guess uh, the two best ones probably is probably around between these two, the lasso and the principal components regression. Yeah, so, so this is what I have learned. And yeah, I just use these three blocks. Uh, one from and what Nile has said, I just read a different chapter. Because she used this blog post for her chapter five, but I just use it for chapter six. And I add more stuff from two blocks on Julia Silky to plot these and plot these GG plots as well as these different principles, these plots as well, these, these plots as well. Yeah, and uh, I think that's it for today. That's perfect. <laughs> um, Anyone else has questions to ask regarding the model? Like, I think Jeremy posted the uh, what was it? The sources, the top, and the link to the slides, also the source 
codes for the slides, as well as the one that we used for the notes last week, I think. Do you do any pull requests, Jeremy? Uh, I, no, I didn't really pull requests because I, I was just doing it on my own GitHub page. Oh, uh, yeah, I realize it. But so that's I, fine if you have nothing to add to it. <laughs> because the book, I don't know how to do book down. I, I think most of the with sharing Gang and Ama down like <laughs> these two and making GitHub pages. <laughs> that's yeah. fine. I, I think probably it's going to be lost somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> if this goes well, I, I just post here in the chat again. If it's <laughs> yeah, that's it's for gonna, it's probably gonna get else. lost. <laughs> yeah, because I, I just create all these using GitHub pages. I I don't really know how to use book down to put all these things together because I think book down uses a different output, right? It's not HTML, it's markdown, I think. I'm not sure. But I have a sense that it's more like HTML, just like the presentation. Okay. Yeah, because I remember it ends with HTML, but I'm really not sure. Maybe yeah. Yeah, because when I do like block down it and do like the Netlify style, it only accepts markdown mm. because the, the Netlify will turn it from markdown to HTML by itself. Yeah, then yeah, then it makes sense it's a markdown document because it's online, right? Yeah, they need to yeah. somehow launch so, it. Maybe it was like from HTML, then they move it to markdown. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyone else has questions uh, regarding the lab? <laughs> yeah. I, I guess <laughs> no questions. <laughs> I guess it's a bit Hard because I think it's the part where you see the tidy models like in the full form. <laughs> I wasn't in the yeah. most full form, but yes. in the most in the basic form whereby if you go for any introduction course, they will go through up to this part whereby it ends with the tuning. So it usually has you usually goes through like uh, Oh, I'm using connection. <laughs> yeah, you usually go through like these steps whereby you do a resample, create a workflow by creating a recipe and a model, and then you use a penalty grid to do the tuning. But I find it's like just because I got confused numbers, so I couldn't like compare which, so I have to like look at it slowly again. <laughs> yeah, I guess it takes time getting used to it. But I think when I do chapter 8, it's also around the same thing, but the only difference is that the tuning will be different because there'll be more than one dimensions. Because for the trees, uh, there are more than one parameters to tune. Sorry, I got disconnected. <laughs> no, I was saying that uh, when I do chapter 8, it was kind of similar except that there are more things to tune. So the tuning grid will have more dimensions. Mm. Did anyone sign up for chapter 8? <laughs> no, I'm the presenter for chapter 8. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> I'll try to prepare for chapter 7. <laughs> Yeah, then we can yeah, talk because about when I, was like, when I was looking at the boosting <laughs> tuning, like from like Julie Silky's blog, there were like three parameters to tune. Like, oh yeah, that's also what the algorithm also was trying to do. The three algorithm, the three parameters of tune, and like. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> 
number uh, about chapter eight. What I read, I have to reread that. Yeah, I think that's the chapter nine, the one that no one signed up yet. <laughs> I think no, someone signed up for chapter nine, right? So was we'll the uh, chapter ten. Okay. And we'll, we'll just figure it out as we go. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's that <laughs> no one will just go through our backup plan. Uh, I think some of us just came in before we, we had our backup plan. Maybe we want to share again what the backup plan is. Oh, for, you mean for next week? Yeah, I think some of us just came in a bit later. Uh, so, uh, for Nile. So, next week, um, no one signed up for Chapter 7 to present Chapter 7. Like I'm really busy these few weeks, so I will not be able to present it as well. So the plan is just we all will read the chapters. Uh, I think she's off. Then coming with questions and should be more than enough to discuss. <laughs> okay. I think it's my connection. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's the end. And I'll see you guys next week. <laughs> after Labor Day. Okay, yeah, after bye. Labor Day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>